in our world today with the plethora of different religions that are out there, there are many different thoughts on the afterlife, like many. Uh, all sorts of different belief systems, what it is, how you get there, what we're going to do, uh, all sorts of different thoughts. But interestingly is that actually, even if you narrow it down, so remove all the other world religions, and we just talk about Christianity for a moment, the reality is that actually for the last 2,000 years inside of Christianity, there have been some differences in thoughts around the afterlife. Now, now we, we all kind of agree on the big picture. But, and we're all looking at the same text of Scripture, but some might see certain components of them one way, and yet another might see them uh, an, another way. The, the, and the reality is that as we come to this topic, uh, and as we look at some Scriptures this morning, and really we're just kind of skimming the top, there's so much in the Bible, but, but some of it can be a little confusing. Uh, some of it is not, at first glance, the easiest thing to understand, and in fact, the Apostle Paul even said this to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 13, when he said that all that we know right now is partial and incomplete, but then we will know everything completely just as God knows us completely. So you have to understand this, that there is a knowing that will happen in the afterlife that simply right now the brightest and the best minds can't begin to understand. Right? Like, like there, there is just this piece that we have to kind of be honest with right in kind of the, the onset of this series. So as, as I approach this, and I've been studying and putting some thoughts together, really uh, I, I want to approach this subject with as much humility as I can possibly muster. And to do so, I thought I would just start by encouraging everyone today. Are you ready for some encouragement? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Point number one, you are going to die. Be blessed. <laughs> it's like in the Psalms, Selah, right? We just rest in that. You no, know, for, for real, um, what the scriptures actually teach is that unless Jesus comes back, to which he most absolutely can do in our lifetime, but if he doesn't, then you and I are going to die. And actually, the, the, the scriptures, and I know, I, I know like we kind of laughed there for a little bit, but the reality is for a lot of us, this is a really uncomfortable thing. Thinking about death, thinking about our death, but again, the, the, the Bible doesn't hide this. I'll just read for you some scripture. 1 Peter 1.24 says this, For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. 2 Samuel 14, 14 says this, we must all die. We are like water spilled on the ground. Or James 4, 14, it says, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Pa Pastor Gary, can you just uh, hand me that? I love that word right there, mist, mist. You know what the Bible says we are? Ready? There it is. Did you miss it? Okay, I'll do it one more time. Ready? We're born, we live, maybe we have kids, maybe we don't, maybe we don't, we die. Gone. That's what the Bible says, that's our life. We also smell like Hawaiian breeze, apparently. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> There's going to be a wafting of fragrance going towards you. But this is the reality of the scripture, right? It does not hide this point. Although we're uncomfortable with this conversation, and some of us, right, we just think we're going to live forever, the reality is we're not. Like, 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 like on, on this side, I'm talking about this side, if Jesus does not come back in our lifetime, and I will repeat, he might. And he most absolutely can come back today. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't come back within the next hundred years, Chances are, every single person that's listening to my voice right now is going to die. The question is, what happens next? What, what actually takes place when we die? Well, I'll give you your second point. If you're taking notes, this would be like a good message this morning to actually write some of this stuff down. So you're going to die. That's number one. Number two, 
your spirit separates from your body. Your body may go into the ground or a mausoleum or you may be cremated, uh, but what actually happens next is your spirit, and by that I mean the very essence of who you are actually never dies. So upon death, your spirit moves into one of two different locations. Uh, and I'll try to explain this. For, for, the, for those who aren't following Jesus, you go to a place that the Greeks called Hades, the Hebrews called Sheol. Uh, it's the same place. Basically, it's the resting place of the dead. Now, this is not where they, they will spend eternity. This is, this is kind of like a, a holding cell, if you will, as they will await their future judgment. That's the first group. But then for the believer, on the other hand, upon death, your spirit moves to a different location. And we read about this in Luke chapter 23. Remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross and the thief said to him, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Do, do you remember what Jesus said? Right? Luke 23, 43, Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus says today. Come on, let me hear you say that. Today. Today, he says today, not tomorrow, not next week, not sometime in the future. No, no, today, your spirit is going to separate from your body, but you will be with me in paradise. Now, this paradise, oh man, if you just want a wild time on the internet, just Google, what is this paradise? All sorts of different opinions, what it is, how it works, and, 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 and there's some stuff that, that, again, this would be kind of the area that, that for a brief season, there, there is a whole bunch of different opinions that would actually all fall under Orthodox Christianity. But here's what we all agree upon. Ready? It's better than here. Okay? This is what we all agree upon. Like, like the, the word that Jesus used here, paradise, it's better it is infinitely better than anything we've experienced in this life. Infinitely. This is why Paul says to the church in Philippians, uh, remember that line, it's very famous, he says, for to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Okay, that, that's a bold comment. Why is death gain to the apostle Paul? Because he understands full well, he also teaches to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? He understands full well that, that the moment that he dies, that his spirit, his body may go into the ground, but his spirit is going to separate from his body, and it is going to be in the very presence of Christ himself in a place called paradise. So somebody asks, okay, well, is that the end of the story? We live, we die, some go to Hades, some go to paradise. Is, is that the end of the story? No, my friend, not even close. Here's my third point. Ready? Next is this. You will experience resurrection when Jesus returns. Oh, <laughs> yeah, this is a fun conversation. We don't know when, and as I already stated about this, we, we don't know when, but here's what we do all have to come to terms with, okay? And here it is. Jesus is coming back, okay? This is not some kind of like, oh, there might be one verse in the Bible that kind of references this, but we don't really know. No, there is several places in the scripture that point out this reality that there is coming a day when the king of all kings is coming back to earth. Okay? Now, th this time he, he's, he, he's not coming like a, like a baby in a manger, right? Like 2,000 years ago. He is coming as king, lord, god. And now, when he comes, a lot of stuff's going to happen. Now, that's not what this series is about. What this series is about is, I just want to uh, kind of hold on to this thought, that one of the things that is going to happen upon the return of Jesus Christ is what we call the resurrection of the dead. Now, again, like I said, this is a really fun conversation for those of us who love Jesus. Because the Apostle Paul, what he does is he's trying to make sense of this phase, the resurrection of the dead. What, what he does is he likens our bodies, our life now, to uh, like planting a seed, right? Seeds 
uh, in and of themselves, you ever hold a seed, right? They're not all that impressive, right? They're just kind of dead little things. But then if you take that seed and you put it in the ground, and then you put some water on top, you give it some sunlight, what happens? Something great comes from something not so great, right? The Apostle Paul says that this is the best image of what we can understand, our bodies. These bodies are like seeds. There, there's really nothing in and of themselves that are all that impressive, right? They, they kind of break down. We've got quirks, dysfunctions, right? But the seed, right, we die. We go into gra- in the ground. The dirt goes on top in one day. One day we will receive resurrection just like Jesus did. So don't make this about some, some weird, we're going to change species and become some sort of ethereal see-through angel with wings. That is not what the Bible says. Okay? That is not what the scriptures teach. We will rise from death just like Jesus. Physical, new, glorified bodies. L- l- listen to what Paul says here, 1 Corinthians 15, as he explains this, starting in verse 42. He says, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown. Okay, so go back to that imagery, right? Sown like a seed. The body that is sown is perishable, but it will be raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, but it will be raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but will be raised a spiritual body. Here's what Paul is saying, and you need... We, we need to hold on to this piece because it's so important. He's saying that there is a resurrection of the body. There is a resurrected body that is available for us in the future that is infinitely better than the one that we're in right now. Infinitely better. I mean, like, let's just talk, okay? The ones we have right now, thank God for them. Honestly, he made us the way that we are. But... Um, anybody realized that they're perishing? Anyone have this awakening yet? Yeah. Like, like for real, like, like we're perishing. And and I've, I've kind of joked about this before, but the reality is I remember summer vacation. Wasn't that amazing? Summer vacation when you were young, I would be on my bike for hours I would play sports for hours. I would go swimming for hours to go to bed at night just to wake up the next day and do the same thing over again now? Honestly, I can hurt myself sleeping. (laughs) And I do. I just go to bed and I wake up and I can't move. Like... It's true, right? Like we've all somewhat experienced this. I have a multicolor beard. It's not by choice, right? The, he, he says like, like there's things in our body, like he uses these words, right? D- dishonorable, perishable, weak, like, like the human body. And again, we praise God for it. It's, it's the shell that God has given us to live in on this side of eternity. But man, it's breaking down. Why am I losing my hair? Why is my beard turning white? The honest answer, ready? Because I'm perishing. And so are you. We are perishing. Now, now, before we all slip into a depression, <laughs> let me bring us out, okay? Yes, we will die. But what the scriptures teach is that there is a day coming. Our body, like a seed, will be sown, but a tree will come up in its place. We will have a resurrected body infinitely stronger, greater, more glorious than anything we've ever experienced on this earth. This is the resurrection of the body. And so let's just do a really quick recap. Uh, Point number one, unless Jesus comes back, uh, you will die. 
Point number two, upon death, your spirit goes to be with Jesus until he returns. Point number three, upon his return, you will be resurrected just like Jesus was in a new glorified physical body. And somebody's saying, now surely, pastor, that's the end of the story. No, no, not even close. In fact, we're not even gonna finish the story today. I still need two more weeks to do that, but... Today, there is one more thing that I want to share, and I'm going to spend probably more time on this point than the others. And the last point that I want to tell you is this, that you will face judgment. And I know that right now, in our postmodern world, we don't have a lot of space for this conversation. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to talk about it. And some of us, you're even offended by it, thinking, who is God to judge me? Let me tell you who he is. He is the creator. We are the creation. He is not accountable to us. We are accountable to him. And I, want, I just want you to listen to me. There is a guarantee for every single one of us, and it's not just death and taxes, it's this. We have an appointment with God when we die. And there's no appeal process. There's no postponements. You can't call in sick that day. We will all, one day, individually, stand before Jesus the judge. I'm going to say that again. We will all, one day, individually, you don't get to stand with me. I'm not sure if I could help you on that day anyway. You don't get to stand with your spouse or your kids or your friends. We will all one day individually stand before Jesus the judge. Now, interestingly, in the scriptures, there are two different judgments that are spoken of that are awaiting humanity. And what I want to do is talk about both of those before we close. The first is, uh, and I have, I have chairs, <laughs> I have thrones. The first is what we call the great white throne judgment. This is the judgment that you don't want to be at. This this judgment here, almost all scholars agree, is that this judgment is reserved for the unbelievers. And we read about this in Revelation chapter 20. We'll, We'll pick it up in verse 11 and 12. It says this, Then I saw, this is John's great revelation, okay? And he's looking forward at this point, okay? And he says this, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, that's Jesus. And the earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And if you scroll down to verse 15 with me, it says this, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So we asked the question really quick, okay, well, what's the lake of fire? Um, Well, we're going to be talking all about that next week. But for now, suffice it to say, it's not good. It's not, it's not good. But for today, actually, what I want to focus on is this. It says that at the great white throne judgment, there is a book called the Book of Life. In this book, the very interesting book, it says that anyone whose name was written in this book, what it does is it secures your salvation, but anyone whose name was not found written in this book, it secures your damnation. So the question is, how do you get your name in the book? Is is that not a good question? If there's a book that is going to be with Jesus the judge 
on that day, how do you get your name registered in heaven? Well, interestingly, the book of life it's referenced another time in Revelation, Revelation 13, verse 8. And I just want you to hear how the book's described. It says this, the book of life of the lamb who was slain. Okay, stick with me. This is very important. The people whose names get written down in this book, their, their, their names aren't written in this book because they were good. Their names aren't written in this book because they deserved it. Their names aren't written in this book because they lived this moral, astute life and did everything right and stayed away from everything wrong. No. Their names are in this book because they put their faith in Jesus, the lamb who was slain. Yeah. Parkwood. Parker, we, we, we need, like, this is the gospel, okay? This is the gospel. You are not good enough, smart enough, rich enough to earn or buy your way in. You're not. Like, on that day, you will either be judged on what you did with your life, or you can be judged on what Christ did with his life. When we put our faith in Jesus, that's what happened, man. Jesus, the lamb that was slain on the cross, he poured out his blood on purpose. This was no mere accident. He died on purpose for us. For us, so that now anyone who calls upon his name, right? You know what happens? Your name gets written down in glory. It's the only way in. It is the only way in. We live in a world that wants to find other ways. Surely there has to be another way. There has to be another way. There's not. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You want to know how to get your name in the book? The only way is by putting your faith in Jesus, the one who lived the life that none of us could have ever lived, died the death that all of us should have died in our place for our sins. And when we do that, when we say yes to Jesus and his finished work on the cross, oh, the best news ever is that our name gets written down in the book of life. But the sobering reality this morning is that for those who don't, for those who say no to the gospel message of Jesus, you will get what you ask for. Your name does not get written down. And the scripture says upon that day is the most heartbreaking, horrendous day maybe in human history. Is that many, it says the imagery here, will be cast into the lake of fire. This is a very serious subject matter. It's not one that I want to preach with some vibrato in my voice or, or lift up like, like this is some joke. There is nothing humorous about this. Nothing. It is serious. And there is a judgment awaiting unbelievers. It is called the great white throne judgment. But this is not the only judgment. There's another judgment that's described in the scriptures, and this is called the judgment seat of Christ. This judgment is very different than this one. This judgment here is a judgment for believers. And we, we read about this, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. I'll, we'll pick it up in verse 10. And I want you to understand, but before I read this, um, 1 Corinthians, it is a letter by the Apostle Paul written to the church in the city of Corinth. We have to understand that context as we read this because he says this, for we, who's he talking about? Not all of humanity. He's not, this is not like earlier in Revelation and I saw the dead. No, this is we, the church. 
we, the followers of Jesus, he says, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done well in the body, whether good or bad. Now, just pause for a minute. Doesn't that sound like works-based salvation? Doesn't that kind of sound like for a moment, okay, so we live, we die, apparently we get to be with Jesus for a little bit, but then there's this judgment coming that he's gonna judge us for the good or for the bad, the things that we did. Like, like it really does seem like on the surface, works-based salvation. And we ask that question, well, I thought Christianity was all about grace. It is. This judgment has nothing to do with your salvation at all. That's the big difference. This judgment does. This judgment doesn't. This judgment right here, the judgment seat of Christ, is a judgment that we will all stand before God on that day. And basically, it's not to determine where we're going to spend eternity, but it's to, to, it's to determine what Jesus will reward us with in the afterlife. So let me, let me explain it this way. You guys, uh, how many Olympic fans do we have? Just me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the Olympics, right? Like, or just most sporting events, right? Racing events, right? You, you run and you run to the best of your ability. And when the race is over, the winners, right? You get up on the little podium and the judge comes and they hand out the medals, the gifts, the rewards, okay? That's the best picture of the judgment seat of Christ. This is not a time for Jesus to say, uh, hey, I don't know, you might be going to the bad place, might be going to the good, that's not what this is about. This is a time when Jesus will hand out rewards for what we did in our life. I'm gonna say it this way, and, and I hope we get this. We are saved by grace, but we are also rewarded for works. We are saved by grace. Like we said, you can't earn your way in. It's just by putting your faith in Jesus, the lamb who was slain. That is the only way in. That is grace, unmerited favor that God's bestowing upon us. Right? But we are also rewarded for works. I'll say it this way. What we do now matters for eternity. Why am I taking time out? I, I could be preaching anything right now. Why, why are we taking time to talk about this? Because it matters. What you choose to do today matters for eternity. We are, we, 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 we are saved by grace, but we are rewarded for work. So we ask the question, okay, so what is God going to judge me on? Are, are, are there specific things? Are there certain areas that God is paying close attention to? And the answer is yes. Yes, absolutely. Like in the scriptures, right, it says this, that we will be judged and rewarded for the words that we speak. Oftentimes, the imagery in the scriptures is a crown. Right? It talks about these, these crowns. Now, this crown is probably a dollar. There is no gold in this, I promise you. But, but, but the Bible speaks of crowns. And it talks about that, that on that day that we will have to give an answer for every empty word that has ever come out of our mouth. Not only is God watching, but God is listening. Not just to what we say, but how we say what we say. And this is what's so hard sometimes with Jesus, is that it's not just about the right action, it's about the, wrong, the, the right motive behind the action. He's paying attention. You know, I, I spent years with Pastor Mark Hazard here in a whole bunch of different ways and areas, and I served really close with him at the end. And You know, I, I learned a lot from him, but, but it, honestly, if there's one thing that, that he impressed upon me more than any other thing, it was, Danny, be very careful what you say. And not just what you say, be very careful how you say what you say. 
The reality is, is that we will stand before Jesus, the judge, and on that day, we will be judged and rewarded for the words that we speak. Secondly, we will be judged and rewarded for how you endure persecution. Revelation 2.10, Jesus says, be faithful unto death and I will give you a victor's crown. In your neighborhood, in your workplace, at your school, when everybody else laughed at you, was mocking you, and you didn't give up, and you didn't give in, in that moment, Jesus is speaking to say, yeah, no one else might have seen that, but I noticed. I was watching. There are rewards given for how we endure the suffering and persecution in this world. We will also be judged and rewarded for leading other people to Christ. I love it. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 says that there is a crown for those who are soul winners. Like, last week was fun. It just was. It was a celebration as we dedicated children and we baptized many people that are saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. It was a party. But I want to ask the question to you. When was the last time that somebody that was in that tank was somebody that you led to the Lord? The responsibility of evangelism and salvation, this is not something that just falls on my shoulders. We, the church, are called to this great mission and clearly in scripture, it says that on that day when we stand before the Lord, this is one of the things that we will be judged and rewarded for. It also says that we will be judged and rewarded for how we treat the poor and the vulnerable. Matthew 25, Matthew 25, I, I love it. It's a strong passage of scripture that Jesus teaches. And he says, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, how you fed them, how you helped them, how you clothed them, how you loved them, it's as if you did it for me. When you gave sacrificially to help the need of the stranger, Jesus saying, I was watching. I was there. I noticed. I saw. Parkwood, what we do now matters for eternity. We are saved by grace. But we will be rewarded for works. And I love the picture. Because even the, there, there's imagery in the book of Revelation where people take <laughs> their crowns and they lay them at the feet of Jesus. They bring them to the feet of Jesus because I believe that one of the most central aspects and components of the afterlife for the believer in how we will find pleasure in life and joy is it's still the same true today, but infinitely more even there it is, it is how we will be found at the feet of Jesus. And I just believe that on that day, some people will have more to worship Jesus with than others. What we do now matters for eternity. Saved by grace, but rewarded for works. And so I just want to close by asking a couple questions. Can we stand on up to our feet? First question. It's very important. Do you truly know Christ? Do you have any level of assurance on this day that your name is written down in the book of life? This is a very important question. Have you put your faith in Jesus, the lamb who was slain on the cross? Like I said, on that day, you will stand before Jesus and you can either give an account of what you did or you can plead mercy and let Jesus stand in front of you. 
And now his righteousness is accredited to us. That's your only option. It's what you do or it's what he did. I'm going to opt for what he did. And if that's you today, I just need to tell you under the authority of God's word, I'm not making a joke of this. I'm not trying to manipulate you into this. But what I'm trying to do is I'm going to say this is, might be the most important, serious decision that you need to make in your life. It's more important than the person you marry. It's more important than the house you're going to buy. It's more important than the career choice that you're going to choose. It, it, like This is the most important thing. Is your name written down in this book? And I just have to give you an opportunity this morning to respond. And so just everyone, just for a moment, if we could just close our eyes in this room. And listen, if you're here today and you're saying, listen, I, I just don't know. I just don't know. I, 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 I want to just call you. I'm not going to make a spectacle out of you. But if that's you, I want you to take one little step of faith. And I just want you to raise your hand right now. No one's watching. But if that's you in this room, would you just raise that hand on up in the air? Thank you, sir. Lift him up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm looking up in the balcony. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, hands up everywhere. You can throw those down. Listen, um, what we're going to do, I just want to lead us into a prayer right now. I want to lead us into prayer. Parkwood family, we're all going to pray this prayer together. This is a very important moment. Um, would you all just repeat after me? The, the, first of all, the Bible says that if we just believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. So let's confess with our mouths this morning. Everyone, let's, let's just pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I'm sorry. I've done it my way. And right now, I need grace. I need mercy. I need forgiveness. Forgive me, Lord, I pray. Wash me clean. Save my soul. Jesus, I need you. What the Bible teaches, what the Bible teaches is that in this moment, Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells three parables. Three parables back to back to back. It's the lost coin, it's the lost sheep, and it's the lost son. All three end in a feast in celebration. And it literally points out that, that, that when one person who is lost comes home, it says that all of heaven erupts in thunderous applause. Can we just join heaven for a moment? That was just my first question. <laughs> Here's my second question. To the rest of us, are you living like eternity matters now? Are you living your life today like it actually matters what's gonna happen in eternity? Like, is that true of you? You know, in Matthew 25, in that amazing teaching that Jesus did on the least of these, it's there, you know, it, it cries out that, that there is a moment coming when he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Can I tell you, I don't always get it right. Ask my wife. <laughs> Some days, man, Danny Gray's a mess. <laughs> but in my heart of hearts, when I live this life, all I want all I want, all that I'm living for is that one day I will stand before Jesus and when he says over my life, Danny, well done, there is nothing else that's gonna matter. <laughs> nothing else. 
Man, the longer we spend on earth, we just get seduced by all the things of this earth. And we start to believe that it matters. The houses, the cars, the job, the friends, the pedigree, all these, we begin to think that it matters. Listen, none of it matters in comparison to that day when Jesus will say, well done. Everything right now, listen to me, everything you do right now, how you speak, how we win people to Christ, how we serve the poor, all these things, man, this matters. He's watching, he's listening. And there will be a day, I don't know when, we will die or he's gonna come back. After that, our spirits will go and we'll be with Christ. After that, we will experience the resurrection of the dead. And then after that, we will stand before Jesus, the judge. And for some, man, that's a sobering reality. But for others, on this day, Jesus will hand out his rewards. Well done, church. Parkwood, let's live for him.